Welcome to the August 2019 Mission, Vision, and Values in Service. Now, we will cover Mission, Vision, and Values along with person centered thinking and a few topics on uh, safety and prevention of fires. To get started, we need to understand what our mission is here at Wendell Foster. It is to empower people with disabilities to realize their dreams and potential. Now, this is our mission here. Every day, we should be striving towards this. But it's hard to do that if we don't really understand what this means. To empower someone is to understand that at some time in their lives or historically, power has been taken away. So we are going to empower people with disabilities who may not have power in their lives or over their lives or in their lives to realize, to understand, and to acknowledge that they can dream, big dreams and small dreams, and to fully understand what their potential is. Now let's look through history and see why this is so important. Throughout history, people with disabilities have been beaten, they've been abused, they've been raped, they've been taken advantage of, and treated as less than human. In fact, if you look throughout World War II, we can see how the people with disabilities were killed in Nazi Germany. We can look in the United States all throughout the early to mid-1900s and see how people with disabilities when they were born to their family a lot of times they were kept in a back room and in the basement this was because in society if you had a loved one and your family born with disabilities this, people in society said that that was a punishment from God for sin in your life well if that's what people believe then then a person with disabilities were not usually out in the community. In fact, they were shunned, they were kept in basements, locked away. A lot of times, they were placed in institutions, not out of horrible intentions, but because people thought that was a better life for them. In fact, doctors recommended it. Doctors only knew what they knew. They only knew what they were trained in. Same thing for the people in the community. So doctors were told that a lot of times people with disabilities were not going to live very long. And they relayed this information to the family members. But they also told them that there are usually ways to help this person. They can live in a state-run institution and not be a burden on family. And they may live a longer life. Not by far, but somewhat longer. So this was the ultimate solution for family members who were scared and confused. Now the untold story about these institutions are very scary. Uh, a lot of times these were, as government run institutions, they had a very tight budget. We can look at places like Willowbrook in New York. And they had staffing ratios anywhere between one staff member to 50 people. And at some other institutions, there was one staff member to 70 people. You can only imagine how horrible the quality of care was. In fact, in these institutions, there was a lot of medical experiments performed on people with disabilities because they were seen as less than human. They were force-fed force feces that was contaminated with hepatitis to see how easy is it to contract hepatitis? They were given injections of viruses and bacteria to note the effect of it on the human body. And a lot of times they had a lobotomy performed on them where the skull was cut open and parts of the brain removed to see how the person reacts. Not to mention all the rapes, all the murders of the abuse and neglect that was happening there so we can understand from that perspective why our mission to empower people with disabilities to come to understand what their dreams are and to live the life to their fullest potential is so important it's actually our heritage here at Wendell Foster empowering people started with Mr. and Mrs. Foster themselves with the birth of their daughter Louise when Louise was born the doctors told Mr. and Mrs. Foster that 
she wouldn't live very long. And that the best options that for them was to go ahead and put her in an institution and just go on with your life. But Mr. and Mrs. Foster, they believed differently. They were not going to just sit back and accept that position in life for their daughter. So what they did is they raised her at home. And it was a struggle. It was tough. Money was tight. But they were making it happen. And then suddenly, World War II was happening. Mr. Foster, he gets drafted into the war. Now, th there are a lot of events throughout Wendell Foster that one could consider more than coincidence. It'd be easily to, very easy to say that they were miraculous events. And this is one where I consider such an occasion. Because Mr. Foster, when he was drafted in World War II, he actually spoke with the people in the military about what his duty would be and where he would be stationed. And he said, I would do whatever you ask of me, but I ask you one thing in return. Please place me somewhere near doctors so I can learn about my daughter's condition and how to best help her in life. Well, usually when you ask the military things like that, they lie. In fact, a lot of times recruiters would tell you, yes, we'll station you in Hawaii. You'll be surfing on the weekends. So you sign on that dotted line, ready to go to Hawaii. And next thing you know, you're being shipped off to Korea. That's typical of the military life. But in this one instance, they kept their word. And they made him a cook at a hospital, working with doctors learning their trade, learning what worked with patients who were suddenly disabled because of the war, and the, the tips and techniques to help them recuperate and live life to the fullest. So that whenever he brought himself home, his friends came home, he was able to apply that with his own daughter. In fact, he had a vision. He had a vision to help others in need. He went ahead and shared this vision with people that mattered to him, that cared to him, such as the Davis County veterans. He told them that he would like to buy this house that was for sale in the community. It was being sold by the Slaughter family. That was their last name, the Slaughter family. They had this old Victorian house that was for sale. And it just so happened they lowered the price to where, with donations from Davis County veterans, Mr. Foster could buy it. Now, that's another outstanding moment in our history. He was able to purchase this house. Now, as we see on the picture on the left, we can see what it looked like at this house in the backyard, where they actually have ladies taking care of them, some of the babies. We have a young lady learning how to walk with their braces on. And you can see Mrs. Foster, Louise herself, on the right, looking at a mirror image of herself. You can also look to the photo on the right, and you can see everybody sitting around the dining room table, enjoying their meal. In fact, this is the same dining room table that you will find in the Elmer building. There's a lot of meals eaten at this table. A lot of laughter, a lot of joy. You can still see Louise Foster there on the left at a different table. They had so many people receiving services there because Mr. Foster went door to door asking their neighbors and people in the community if there was somebody there with a disability that he could help. He opened his doors to his home for these people. For a dollar a day, anybody can go there to receive services and support. And if you couldn't afford that dollar, it was free. I had a lot of support from the community. Ladies in the community coming to volunteer. Farmers were bringing off produce so that they would have all the meals that they needed. You had people donating money. It was great. His vision became a reality until the sad day in which the community slowly forgot about Wendell Foster and his vision. One day, Mr. Foster had a meeting with the board of directors and was told that we have one more day to keep the doors open. 
There's no more food. There's no more milk. There's no more money. This was the worst possible situation he could ever imagine. But it also led to another outstanding event in our history. Because he was not one to give up easily. In fact, he got on his hands and knees. He encouraged the people that were receiving services there, that were living there, the people that were volunteering there, to hit their knees and start praying for help. And honestly, it wasn't that much time that passed when they suddenly got a, a knock on the door. And here is the milkman dropping off milk to Mr. Foster. But wait a minute. Mr. Foster said, I can't pay this. I don't have any money. The milkman said, Sir, it's already paid in full. This is for you for the week. It's for the kids. And behind the milkman, here starts coming the farmers dropping off produce. We can see all the stuff that was dropped off in this picture we're looking at. You can see people praying, giving thanks. And not only did the farmers bring their food, people of the community bringing money, but also the ladies of the community coming to this location where the food was to help can it and preserve it so they can use it throughout the year. Talking about community support, they are the reason that we're still here today. So by looking at this story and how people are treated with our history, we can see that in our humble beginnings, our mission to empower people with disabilities to realize their dreams and potential has always been there. And it's even alive today. Whether you realize it or not, every single day, great things are happening that lives up to our mission. So let's talk about a few of those stories. Such as an event that happened not too long ago. It's called a Tough Mudder. And there's a guy named Zach who had a dream to do the Tough Mudder. In fact, he wants to live his life like a daredevil, a thrill seeker. And this was a, toward the top of his list of what he wants to do. But when you're faced with physical disabilities, this can be kind of tough. Well, hence the name Tough Mudder. And it can be kind of nasty too, as we can see. Because the people you see in the picture... They're very selfless in their duties. And they took it upon themselves to make this dream a reality. Now anybody else, a lot of times you watch people engaging this activity. You may see somebody in a wheelchair on the sidelines cheering them on. But that's not good enough. Because this is Zach's dream. It's not their dream. So whatever they did, Zach did. They literally picked him up. Got him muddy like they were. Ran obstacles with him. At one point, the chair that he was in was picked up by all the people that were helping him and carried through water that was up to their chest. See, he wasn't just on the sidelines rooting them on. No, he was fulfilling his dream and living his life to his fullest potential. And here we can see the after picture. A muddy mess. Now to this day, if you ask, ask Zach how to go, he'll tell you it was great and he'll show off his medal. It's funny though, because if you ask him if he's going to do the next one, he'll say, nope. I marked that off my list. I've been there. I've done that. Let's go on to the next one. I want to go skydiving. And there's many more stories, such as this one, which starts out like your typical dramatic tale. It was a cold winter's day at Wendell Foster. The parking lots were iced over. Car doors were frozen shut. And the Century Park was a slippery mess and everybody was slipping and sliding. The staff were huddled inside the cottages not wanting to go out into the cold. But there was somebody working in an SCL that had a thought. They were wondering if the people that they were supporting had ever been sledding. 
I mean, it's a rite of passage from childhood. Most of us built ramps, earned scars, bumps, bruises. It's great fun. And whenever you see snow, it always makes you want to bring out that childhood in you and, you know, get that snowball and throw it and have fun. Well, shouldn't the same be, be for anybody, despite what ability they have? And so they had an idea, they had a sled, they had a rope, and they had a four-wheel drive gator. <laughs> Let's not forget they also had permission. That's very important too. So they tied this rope to the gator, tied a sled to it with permission, had BJ drive it, and they had a lot of fun. They supported the people living there on the sled. Toes were frozen, fingers were numb, snot was everywhere, but so was the fun. Just another example of what we do and how we do it. In fact, our mission isn't just about people that live here. It's not just about people that interact with Wendell Foster. It's about people with disabilities. And that includes Gary, a gentleman who's lived here a couple of times but now lives in an SEO home. I've known Gary for many years, and he is always quick to talk about one of his biggest heroes in life, his brother. His brother's a Navy man, and Gary is so proud of that. In fact, this pride for the Navy spills over into his admiration for the Blue Angels, which is the representation of the great things that the Navy does. And so one day when the Orangeboro Air Show is going on and the Blue Angels are there while Gary is watching from a distance a friend of his had an idea I have no idea where John Gleason got this phone number from but he contacted people that work with the Blue Angels and persuaded them to come visit Gary here at Wendell Foster so you see Gary had this dream and with support, it was fulfilled. And here's the kicker. John Gleason, this isn't his job to do it. He did it because he's got the heart for it. And he saw that Gary had a dream. He cares about Gary. He wanted to make it happen. And then we have Bryant. Anytime you talk with Bryant, you will quickly understand that this man is a world traveler on the internet. He has been all over the place. There's, I doubt that there's a country he has not visited. In fact, when I get on his Facebook, I check his feed, and I will see all of these places I've never heard of before that he has been, that he's checked into. And he will talk with you all about the culture of that place. He studies it. He, this man, I can really see him having his own TV show. But sometimes traveling over the internet is not good enough. And it wasn't for Bryant. You see, he's had his dream ever since I known him to go to Epcot Center. And it was the wonderful people of the Recreation Department to help make this happen. They took the ultimate road trip in a Wendell Foster van that is Probably not going to go much above 70 miles an hour without it shaking like a space shuttle doing a re-entry. They took a long trip, drove all the way to Florida to go to Epcot Center. Now some people will tell you it took 40 days and 40 nights to get there. They were close. I think it took 23 hours of driving to get to Epcot Center. And when they arrived, they were tired. They were tired. They didn't have the energy, but they had the positive attitude. And when CJ paired up with Bryant and said, okay, this is your trip, dude. What do you want to do? Trust me, Bryant had a list, and it was in order. And one of the great things he experienced, besides seeing all the culture, exploring the culture, meeting new people, was trying new foods such as churros. Anytime you get the chance, please go talk with him. Ask him about his trip. He will put that book down and you'll see him light up. Thanks to the people in the rec department, his dream was fulfilled. 
and we can talk about other other places like Corf all day long. These people are rock stars. The creativity that they have, the heart that they have, and the fact that they don't just empower people with disabilities, they empower their family too. And they, they come from the aspect of let's treat the person to, let's help them achieve their full potential, not the immediate need. A great story of this is about Ryan, our physical therapist. He was telling me about this family that he was uh, helping. They had a child that was born at 24 weeks, which is very, very early for a child. In fact, this child weighed less than a pound. And you can only imagine the, the medical problems this child had. And it, actually, it took 11 months for this child to start receiving physical therapy. When a child is born that early, usually you want physical therapy to start right away and be very aggressive. So this child can minimize any milestones, such as holding his head up. Minimize those milestones from being missed or delayed. Well, at this point, a lot of milestones had been missed, had been delayed. And Ryan said this, this child's just laid there. And when talking to mom about goes to work towards she cannot get past her goal is for a child to be healthy and safe healthy and safe I, I can't even put myself in those shoes I can I can understand as much as I can you want your child to be healthy and safe but Ryan he came from the from the mindset of let's look at the full potential of this child why just aim for the moon? Let's hit for hit, let's aim for the stars and see what we can hit. So he asked her, "Would you want your child to walk one day?" Well, yeah. She answered, "Yes." Well, he said, "Well, why limit our that this child to healthy and safe when we can shoot for the possibility of your child walking?" And so Ryan, the child, and mom worked extremely hard. Lots of effort. And this child is flourishing. And this child is its on the go, crawling, holding his head up all over the place, getting in trouble all the time. In fact, this child is so mobile now. And getting in so much trouble, it accidentally pulled out his G-tube. You see, this child wasn't taking full nourishment by mouth. It had a G-tube for most of the nourishment. And so while crawling around one day, which is awesome the child got to this point where it's crawling around it accidentally pulled out the g-tube so mom and dad called the doctors immediately doctors are in Louisville and they said in three days I want you to come up here and we'll we'll go ahead and put it back in in the meantime get this child as much nutrition by mouth as you possibly can so mom's nervous she's working with the child providing as much nourishment by mouth as possible the day that she's traveling to Louisville, she calls a doctor, giving him an update, saying we're on our way. And he asked her the question about how much nutrition is this child receiving by mouth. Well, she gave him the answer. Well, he said, well, ma'am, you need to turn around and go home. Your child's doing great. Your child doesn't need a G-tube anymore. Just go home and keep doing what you're doing. What amazing progress. And this progress happens with people that we serve and support in Corf because we don't limit people and their potential. We think big and we work, work toward those big potential goals. And in doing so, people's lives change. Such as somebody like Andrew. You see... I remember Andrew had a special uh, had an annual conference once, and we're trying to figure out who is Andrew. Everybody plays roles in their lives. They have hobbies and relationships and things that identify who they are. They're called social value roles, and we're trying to figure out what is Andrew's. And so we finally narrowed narrowed it down that he's an outdoorsman. And once you know it, we got it wrong. He was quick to correct us that. He's a fisherman, and it, he loves fishing. He just lights up when he does it, but he's very limited in how he can fish independently. Well, 
it just so happens that over in occupational therapy they have this they have this person named Ronnie and in the field of occupational therapy well he's kind of like MacGyver you give this guy some duct tape tongue depressors and a problem he's gonna make some magic happen and he did that with Andrew he started with adapting a fishing rod holder to Andrew's chair to hold the fishing rod at the correct position for fishing and he worked very hard in getting this device set up just perfect and then he eventually over time attached a button to the fishing rod that Andrew could hit and it would launch a lure off the fishing rod into the water and then by using a strap hand over hand Andrew was able to reel that in they worked very hard to achieve the goal of being as independent as possible with fishing. In fact, they practiced all the time. See, you see, we used to have this uh, little goldfish pond in the Century Park. Beautiful little little pond that we had. And it, every morning, somebody has to go out and feed it. Well, if you get here early enough, you will see Andrew doing the so-called feeding of the fish with his fishing pole and it's a great way to practice because you want to practice in the environment you'll be working with then and so you, you know casting your rod your lure onto the dry ground it's not going to be as good as casting into water right and so that's where they were practicing and that was harmless to the fish of course and they got to eat their food probably lots of food but it wasn't the same as going to a lake and then the day happened years later and they're still working every day on this that Andrew had a vacation of a lifetime. He was going to Lake Tahoe. Now keep in mind, this is not a place where you go to go shopping. This is not a place you go to just go lounge on the beach. No. Lake Tahoe, this is a place where you go to do some serious fishing. So Andrew, he left on, a, on an airplane. And the great thing about it was the gentleman who was there every step of the way to help him reach his full potential and realizing this dream was sitting right next to him. There was Ronnie, whom I call MacGyver. <laughs> we, there's so many stories. We had the Action Club. This is a, gl a club that works in collaboration with Kiwanis that was started in December 2018. This is a service leadership club for adults with disabilities. They started with just a few members. They've grown to almost, I think, 12 now. They have regular meetings to discuss service projects, goals to participate in, and at least once a month they engage in service projects in the community. They helped with food drives, putting up flags at the courthouse, making and delivering Easter baskets to children living at the Patino Shelter, and they participate in Club Scouts Disability Awareness Day. You see, the Action Club is the only service club for adults with disabilities. Worldwide, they have more than 12,000 members. And we have it here at Wendell Foster. They are not just in the community. They are the community. There's so many stories we can talk about. And all with the stories and the dreams that people dream of, there's none that are too big or too small. That's the whole point of this. Our mission every day is not some big pie in the sky idea that we're not sure if we can do. It's very reachable. In fact, look at all of these stories. And for everyone you see, there's hundreds more. Everything from relationships with people to running a half marathon. Every day, we empower people to realize their dreams and potential. So my question is, as employees here at Wendell Foster, Whose responsibility is it to fulfill our mission? Well, the answer is it's all of ours. 
every single day we come into work, we have we have the responsibility to make a decision. What are we going to, to do today to realize people's dreams potential? Now moving on, we also have Wendell Foster's vision. Now this is on the test. Now, on the test, you'll see where question one is a trick question. It's actually false. Number two, our vision to be the region's resource for developmental disabilities. But what is the region we're talking about? Are we talking just about 815 Triplet Street? Are we talking only what's in Owensboro, Kentucky? No. We're talking bigger than that. You see, right now, we serve people throughout Davis County, Bowling Green, Ohio County. We have worked to train people in person-centered thinking as trainers in Louisville, in Indiana. We have worked with people in Indiana to help them with their culture shift. We serve people in Hancock County. In fact, if you look at how many people CORF serves, 642 people, that is a number I could not even imagine. That's how many people that we support just by one department alone. And we have community outreach. We go to the school systems. And John Gleason and Leslie, they talk about the No R Word campaign, helping inform students and empowering students. And we have our assistive technology department, which is a lending library for people who have different needs in life. Maybe they need adaptive equipment. They can learn about it here at Wendell Foster. They can look at what we have. They can try it out. And they can borrow it for free. So our our vision at Wendell Foster to be the region's resource is powerful. But another question to ask is, can we be that resource as individual employees? Well, my response is yes. In fact, just this week I had somebody come to me and say, hey, how do I get speech therapy here at Wendell Foster? Well, I'm a resource for this person. You see, I don't have to know the entire process, but I can direct them to who does know. So I told them, you need to talk to Kay over on Corf. She's the process expert. She can help get you started. I was a resource. Every day, you're a resource. So don't be afraid to answer questions you don't know. It's not about what you know. It's about who do you know and helping that person navigate the system. Now let's look at our values. Our values are the standards that we uphold every day. Whenever we make decisions here at Window Foster, we should pair our decisions up with our values. If it matches, then you're on the right track to making a good decision. Our values just it's a lot more than that. It's our culture here. It's what makes us unique. In fact, our values are what we want every employee to adopt and to reflect in their daily work lives. Now, I'm not going to read all of these word for word, but I am going to pick out a few of them, such as innovation. Innovation can be so hard to describe, but let me break it down really easy. All the time, I hear people being praised for thinking outside the box. Well, if we praise people for thinking outside a box, why do we have this box to begin with? Just throw that darn thing away and just start thinking creatively. That's what innovation is. is you think outside a box. You come up with new ideas. You apply an idea, a technique to a different area. It's being very creative, open-minded, flexible. It's about not saying we can't. It's about saying we can. Now let's figure out how we're going to do it. It's about always learning about new ideas, new technology, new techniques. And then we have the value of having a positive attitude. 
having a positive attitude helps create a positive culture and we have a culture here where people learn to be independent people come here to heal people come here to learn how to grow and develop new skills and if we don't have a positive attitude here then that culture is not going to support people in growing and developing into who they're going to be in life but here's the important part about it, positive attitude it's easy to have it on the good days it's on the tough days that we really need to put forth the effort and struggle to make it happen just remember though we're doing it for the right reason it makes the effort worthwhile so even on the hardest days put a smile on your face think about the here and now get throw yourself into your work and you let that positive attitude just shine right through your bad day now let's talk about professionalism you can ask five different people what is the definition of being a professional and you'll get at least five different answers that's because professionalism has many different meanings you see when I think of a professional I visualize in my head different professionals I've come in contact with and usually they have the they have commonalities that you can see across the board with almost every professional you interact with. It's the way they dress. They dress business casual. Maybe they dress more than business casual, but they dress for the job that they not only have, but for the job that they want. And then they have this bearing of politeness, of confidence and being agreeable to people they have these mannerisms that make you feel included in everything and they don't just talk over you they listen they hear what you have to say and then they formulate a thought that's what's called being a professional and no matter what job duty a person has here we should be professionals because how can we have the public take us seriously when we say we're the region's resource if we don't act like it being a professional is very important and it's one thing that we should all keep in mind no matter where we are what we're doing somebody's looking somebody's watching and they're going to judge us by how we act so keep in mind that we should be professional at all times. And that's one area in which we could always grow in. And then finally, let's talk about trust. We cannot empower people to realize their dreams and potential if there's no trust. They have to be able to trust us every day. Even on the little things. When we say we're going to do something, we need to do it. We cannot expect the community to see us as a region's resource for people with disabilities that they cannot trust us. So when we tell them we're going to do something, we need to do it. See, trust is so hard to earn. Very easy to lose. One thing to keep in mind is we have to trust each other. And what we don't want to do is have this mindset where we think that I will give trust when they show me trust. It doesn't work that way. We should trust easily. And we feel like we can't trust some more. Too often we don't give people the understanding that mistakes happen. And we cause that to break to allow trust to be broken down. We need to forgive more. And develop a trusting relationship to people we support and the people we work with and with the community so let's be intentional every day and try to trust people more and let's foster more trust in what we do it starts with being reliable being hopeful and confident and not my ability 
in other people's abilities too. That is all I have for you today when it comes to mission, vision, and values. And I hope that this is a topic that we take seriously here. Because it is at the foundation of who we are and it is our culture. It defines this environment that we work within. Another thing that defines the environment we work within is that of person-centered thinking. Person-centered thinking is often misunderstood. It's not about performing tools and tasks. It's not about life-shattering changes in an organization. It's about thinking in a person-centered way. It's all about realizing that we all have things in life that make us happy, content, and fulfilled. And that includes the people that live here. And it could be something as small as putting a creamer in my coffee or something as big as shaking my hand when you meet me the first time. And all these things don't require any money. They're free. And these are all the things that we would expect others to do for us if we lived here. So I'm going to show you a skill on how we can become a more person-centered here at Wendell Foster. And it's called the one-page profile. The one-page profile has many uses, one of which is it's a great way to introduce people to others, especially people that maybe they're awkward around other people, socially backwards, or maybe they have a disability, and the disability becomes their identity around other people, which is what we don't want. Or maybe we can use it to show our co-workers that we're more than an employee, we're, an, we're a person. A person with emotions and feelings. That's what the One Page Profile is about. It's about giving people information that's often hard to share. So here you have mine. And we can see my top right hand corner, my beautiful wife. My gorgeous daughter. You can see my son at the bottom along with my dog, that's Lacey. You can see me at the beach. We can call that my happy place. But then we see three main components. You have what I call the introduction, which helps formulate a positive reputation with somebody the moment that they read this. Then you have what's called important to me. These are things that make me happy, content, and fulfilled in life. And third, you have how to best support me. How to best support me when I'm having a bad day at work. This is very important. And a lot of times our co-workers don't know this. So when it comes to important twos, again, it's what makes us happy, content, fulfilled. It could be anything. In fact, I believe we all have so many things that make us happy, content, and fulfilled in life that it could fill up pages and pages and many books. It's endless. And every day we, we, we gain more important twos. Now what I have listed here are just some examples kind of prime to pump and get you thinking about it. And when you fill out a one-page profile, you can write that down very easy as a list. And yes, there are other tools that we can use to help us think in a more person-centered way to identify what's important to people and to us. But at its core, you can just write these down of what you know about somebody. And so, one-page profiles are blank. They're available. All you have to do is write down on this one-page profile what's important to you. What makes you happy, content, and fulfilled in life. It just takes a minute to fill that out. And the next thing you're going to figure out is how to best support the person. Now, this could be a bad day at work. It could be a bad day of therapy. It could be just a day you got out of bed on the wrong side. Whatever it is, we need to write down how to best support the person, not how to fix the person because nobody's ever broken. Not how to go back in time and prevent this from happening because it's too late for that. 
how to best support me. For example, if I have a bad day at work because I'm late. I showed up 15 minutes late. My schedule's all out of whack now. Well, wouldn't it be good for my coworkers and for my boss to know how to best support me to make this bad day a little bit easier? Help minimize the pain of it. Because a bad day can turn into a bad two days, a bad week, a bad month, a bad year. So how can we put some supports in place to minimize the impact of this bad day? And that's what you should write down where it says best supports. Now this is where we do an exercise to find out what our reputation is. You see, a lot of times we are way too harsh on ourselves and we don't see ourselves through the same lens that other people do. I wish we could. I wish we all had a magic lens and we could see ourselves the way other people do. But we don't. But we do have this exercise. And on this exercise, you go to other people and you have them write down. What do you like and admire about me? This is a great exercise. It's very useful for people who are stuck in a system where they have very little power or control. Maybe they have negative reputations. Because remember, negative reputations are very easy to attain. All it takes is screwing up one time, right? Well, this is a great way to get over it. You, so you have you walk around to people that know you. Have them write down what they like and admire about you. And if you're afraid that they're not going to be honest with you, get the paper to somebody else and have them go around and write down what they like and admire about you. Have them ask other people, what do you like and admire about Wes? And you'll get honest answers. And when you get that paper back, You'll find that one thing, you have to understand, this is what people say about you. It's yours, so own it. Number two, this is something you should be proud of. So take the opportunity to find out, what do people like and admire about you? Now keep in mind, when we do this exercise with people, you may find that we don't know them very well, and that's okay. If that's the case, we don't write anything at all. Because it's not acceptable to say that I like the way you eat. <laughs> that's just totally wrong. It's not acceptable to say I like how you smell. Okay, that's um, not very deep there. Instead, we want people who will be honest, truthful, and actually know you. And remember, above all, the rule that if you have nothing nice to say about somebody, let's not say it at all. Now, after doing my exercise to find out my reputation, I used what was listed and I put it into sentences as a way to introduce myself to people. I didn't use all of what people wrote. I took the highlights. And here's my positive introduction. So when people read my one-page profile for the first time, whether they met me or not, here is who I am. Here's what people say about me. This is a true Wes. Now this is great to use because when the first 15 seconds of meeting somebody, they will form a first impression about you. This gives you control on what that first impression is going to be. So if you're working with a new coworker, hit them on your one-page profile that has your positive introduction written on it. So once you do this exercise, take a minute to look at what people wrote Pick and choose what you want to write about and draft your own positive introduction. When you're finished, you will have your one-page profile. So now what? Well, hopefully we don't throw it away. Hopefully we put this to good use. Share it with your co-workers. Share it with your boss. Share it with the new guy that's working. Share it with an employee that you have friction with because usually that comes from misunderstandings and assumptions. And that's where the one-page profile flourishes. It eliminates any assumption about who the person is. Now finally, we're going to wrap this up talking about a few safety tips. It's very important. These are things we discuss in orientation that we need to 
refresh ourselves about. So first off, when putting out a fire, you have fire extinguisher. They're located everywhere. You'll find them attached to the walls. They're in a little metal cubby hole. They're checked by maintenance regularly, so they are full and they're ready to use when using one of these. Remember the acronym Pull, Aim, Squeeze, Sweep. That is PASS. The acronym PASS. Because that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to pull the pin that's on that lever. The only thing this pin does is prevent you from engaging the lever. Then you're going to aim the hose at the base of the fire. You do not aim it at the flames. You aim it at, directly at the base of the fire. You squeeze the handle and you're going to sweep this hose left to right from one, one edge of the base of the fire to the other until the fire is put out. Keep in mind though that these fire extinguishers are, are very useful but they're not magic. They are only good for fires that are about the size of a trash can. If it is bigger than that, grab it, keep it with you. Maybe you can help prevent further spread. But what you're going to really need to do is pull the fire alarm and evacuate. Evacuate the people out of there. Evacuate the guests. Evacuate anybody that's receiving the services. And evacuate your co-workers. But remember, fire extinguishers are everywhere. Do not be hesitant to use them in case of a fire. If you did use it, but well definitely fill out that incident report and let maintenance know so we can recharge it. Now, when it comes to fire safety, prevention is best. Now, if it wasn't for my wife, I would not have known that dryers have this thing called a lint filter. And they are very handy in keeping lint out of the dryer hose and away from the heating elements in a fire. But it should be cleaned out regularly. If you don't clean this out, the lint builds up. And being that the dryer is a source of heat and it gets very hot, this lint becomes combustible when it actually accumulates. So make sure we clean that out after every single use. And just for your own knowledge when you're home, there is a hose that hooks up to your dryer that you should check twice a year to make sure there's no clogs going and clean it out. Another thing to keep in mind is electrical cords need to be in good shape when we're using them. I was using a cell phone charger the other day that I was quite proud of because I've had this for six years. It came with my phone. I had this thing plugged in. It's charging my phone. I looked down. I noticed that piece of tape I had on there was gone. And I see a lot of bare wires. I was halfway afraid to unplug these things. I didn't want to die. All right, it's at this point that that charger needs to be thrown away. Get a new one. Do not use frayed electrical cords. Do not use extension cords here at Window Foster unless maintenance has approved it for the use that you have in mind. Because with extension cords, you get what you pay for. Some of the cheap ones are only good for plugging in LED Christmas lights, and they're not good for use outside of the home. Others are more heavy-duty, and they're rated for a certain amount of power draw. So get with maintenance. Don't just assume that you have the right one. Get with maintenance, because this is a life safety code issue, and see if it's the right thing to use. And respect their decision if they say no. Also, I had no idea until the uh, gentleman in maintenance uh, educated me on it, but the smoke detectors actually have lifespan. I had no idea about this. The lifespan is about five years. I think mine in my house is probably 20. So, yes, I'm shopping right now to get a new smoke detector or two. So, not only should you change the batteries out in them twice a year at the time change, we should also change our smoke detector out every five years because technology, technology changes, plastic degrades along with the elements inside. And while you, you keep that in mind, let's go ahead and refresh ourselves on the fire evacu evacuation procedures in our workplace. Every department is a little bit different and it's up to you to know what those procedures are because you have new staff to rely on you to help them learn these procedures or they may be so new they don't know it themselves and in case of a fire they're going to look to you to say what do we do. 
So please update yourself regularly on your policy and procedure manual. Get familiar with it. If you have any questions about it, go ahead. Ask those questions to your supervisor. Find those answers out. And while you're at it, look around your work area for any potential hazards. It is our responsibility to take, to take care of those on an individual basis. Now, if it's something that we can't take care of, and it's a duty that maintenance needs to handle, make sure you fill out that work order. They're very good at keeping us safe around here, and they will take care of that problem right away. Now, let's talk about some events that are coming up, and I'll let you go. We have the Special Needs Expo that's happening August 17th from 10 to 2 p.m. This will be at the Convention Center. So if you have time, please support us by stopping by, stopping by the booths, seeing what all is there to offer. We also have the Wendell Foster Speech Therapy Department accepting new patients now. So again, this is an opportunity for you to be the resource. So if you see somebody who has a need, they're asking about speech therapy services, we are now accepting new, new patients. Also, every year we have the Wendell Foster Auction. It's a benefit dinner and auction. This year will be September 7th at 6 p.m. at the Orangeburg Convention Center. We need volunteers for this. You can volunteer for the entire event or for just a couple of hours. Either way, a little bit helps. If you don't want to be at the center of attention in front of everybody volunteering, that is okay because you can help us set the event up where nobody else is around, or you can help us tear it down afterwards. And I'll be honest with you, we need help tearing this event down afterwards because time is very essential with this. So if you can donate just a couple of your hours, and a little bit goes a long ways. And let's not forget about the Wendell Foster Half Marathon. It is coming up March 14th. This is a great event. Last year it was huge. This year it will be bigger. Being that the event is bigger this year, we really need help. So, here's an idea. We all, have, we all have friends that owe us a favor. Go ahead and steal their cell phone. Open up their calendar. Put on their calendar that they will be at this event to volunteer. Because time the march runs around, they will not remember what they volunteered for. Sign up your friends and go and sign yourself up for it. We need all the help we can get to make this event happen. And finally, on Monday, August 26, 2019, at 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., Cindy Houston and I will be hosting a Person-Centered Thinking Tools for Family event. This is an event for family members, for service recipients, for caregivers, to learn in detail how to make one-page profiles, to learn about person-centered thinking skills of the important two, important four balance, and also how to do the good day, bad day skill. Again, this is for surface recipients, their families, their friends, their care caregivers. They will walk away with a one-page profile, a digital copy of it, and a small worksheet showing how to update it. So if you know anybody's interested, please refer to them to our Facebook page. In fact, for any of the events I just listed, refer to our Facebook page under events. All the information is given there. Thank you very much.